now that we are comfortable uh, performing a statistical test using one sample we'll uh, move our attention to the next aspect when i take two samples at a time what are the different kinds of tests that i can perform on that uh, two samples taken together so agenda wise we'll talk about uh, different types of tests that we can perform right probably i may be comparing the means i may be comparing the variances so there are various things that i want to compare across two or more samples so i want to really see what are the various tests that i can perform so we'll uh, once we know the list we'll start looking at what is the test that is more appropriate if i have to compare between the two variances of two different populations how do i compare the variances between the two populations by picking up the samples from those two different populations if i have to compare the means between the two populations and uh, come out with a conclusion what kind of test that i can use so in the process we will be understanding the students t test in detail right which we have used even for uh, one sample case but in two sample case how do i use the student t test then we'll also talk about wilcoxon rank sum test which is again the non parametric version of the student t test especially when your data is non normal right or you have seen there are so many outliers that are present in the data in which case the t test any parametric test will not be a, a much helpful so although we will will rely on non parametric tests like wilcoxon rank sum test then we will also talk about if i have to do some kind of testing with respect to the samples which are not independent but which have some kind of relationship between them which are very much uh, dependent on each other so these are called as a paid samples so if my samples are paid how do i really evaluate Uh, or how do i really uh, assess uh, or test the means between those samples then the next test looks at if i have to compare two proportions how do i use the binomial test to compare the proportions of two groups then we will uh, move on to multiple group scenario where we can uh, bring in a chi square test where we call it as contingency table so if i have to uh, compare by creating a contingency table and if i have to take my decision regarding the independence of two categorical variables independence between the categorical variables i can think of using a chi square test so we'll see how to use the test and how do i make my interpretations so for doing this we have couple of tests we'll talk about pearson chi squared we'll talk about g test of contingency we'll also use fisher's exact test for addressing the same problem and then we'll look at the level of interdependence between two continuous variables using the concept of correlation and covariance and then we will bring in two variable uh, we will try to look at uh, the kolmogorov smirnov test or ks test wherein we are trying to compare the data with a particular distribution is this data following a normal distribution is this data following an exponential distribution so that is what we will do using the kolmogorov smirnov test so we'll try to use that particular test and towards the end we will end this session using performing a power analysis of a particular test and trying to assess uh, what is the power of our test for this particular sample of data so getting uh, uh, into the next aspect where the first thing we are trying to understand is what are if i am given two samples right if i am giving two different samples and i am asked to perform different kinds of tests on it so these are the various tests that i can look at if i really want to compare the variances between the two samples and say if the variances are significantly different or more or less similar then i can use either a fisher's f test 
which is typically used through a formula called or a function called var dot test in R. So wherever my objective is to compare the variances between the two groups, we'll take the example. Wherever if I have to compare the variance between the two groups, I would typically use a Pisher's F test, which is executed through var dot test command in uh, R. Similarly, if I am having two two different groups and I want to compare the sample means between the two groups but the sample means are having normal errors. The errors are normally distributed, outliers are not there. In that case, if I have to compare the means between the two groups of data, I can use a student t test which is executed through a function called t dot test in R. Similarly, if I want to compare the means of two different samples, but their errors are not normal. So, which indicates that there might be good number of outliers present in the data. In that case, as we have discussed earlier also, we can't use a parametric test like a t-test. In that case, I have to rely on the Wilcoxon's rank test itself, which is executed through a function Wilcox does test. Then if I have to compare the proportions between the groups, right? Uh, is the pass percentage uniform across class 1 and class 2? Uh, or is the uh, stock price change uniform across cross class 1, uh, across small companies versus big companies? If I have to do a comparison of two proportions, then I am looking at binomial test where we are using prop.test. That is the function that we are using to compare the proportions across the groups. Then, if I want to find out the correlation between two scale variables or two continuous variables, then I can use a Pearson correlation coefficient. And if I want to compare the correlation between two ordinal variables, then I can use Pearman's rank correlation coefficient. And both of them can be executed through a, a function called core.test, which is what is trying to find out the correlation between the various sets of data. And if I want to really look at two uh, uh, two variables, two categorical variables, either nominal or ordinal. And I want to really look at the independence between them, level of independence between two non-quantitative variables. This is what we create as a contingency table and assessing the independence of that contingency table can be done through a chi-square test where we would be uh, using a formula called chisq.test. So in this session, majorly we are focusing on all these kinds of tests. We'll take examples on the data and based on that, we'll try to create all these kinds of tests. All right. So let's get started with the first one where I would be interested in comparing the variances across the two groups. So I want to really test whether the sample variances are significantly different or not. So I want to take two groups of data from this uh, table. So let me load this uh, data again. Okay, so I have to load this data. So let me load it from my folder there. And we have already seen earlier also if I am looking at the head of this price. So this is what is the typical data and if I look at the dim of the price, it will show me that there are 1531 rows and 9 columns for this data. Now, what I really want to see when I am comparing the variance is, I want to test whether the sample variances are significantly different or not. So with this question, I really uh, want to see if the variance of the moderate group, right, probably let me look at the tail, right, to see what kind of groups are there. There are some small, there are some moderate, and there are some big. So what I really uh, want to see is, uh, now that we are seeing some moderate and some small, all I really want to see is whether the variance, right, variance of the change, the change in price, is it uniform across the two groups? One is a small group, the other one is a moderate group. 
so i really want to see is the variance uh, across these two groups significantly different or is it more or less the same so normally speaking i will divide the larger variance by the smaller variance if i have to go with a theoretical kind of an approach i have to find the larger variance versus the smaller variance so i'll take the variance of price dollar change dot 1 if i am taking it for the entire data right or probably it's better that i take uh, okay let's take the price first let's take the data into a, a separate uh, variable altogether i'll take a variable called small right uh, i'm taking a variable called small where i'm taking a subset of price so wherein i am saying price dollar groups is equal to small so wherever the price dollar groups is small that would become my subset so the small is a subset why is it not coming undefined column price dollar groups mm okay so i have to get uh, i don't need to get the price sorry uh, i have to get the price dollar uh, change dot 1 i have to get the price dollar change dot 1 so probably i want to get the change dot 1 of the groups where the group is equal to small so if you look at uh, the small now this is your small there are almost 380 odd kind of data which are going into small now the same thing i'll form a group called moderate right i'll form a group called moderate where i am getting the change in price where the price dollar groups is moderate right all right so i am getting moderate so if i am looking at the dimensions of small it is uh it is uh, null because uh, it's a vector so i can look at the length of small which says 383 and i can take the length of moderate which is 765 so i have 765 moderate values and 383 small values i will find out the variance that is associated with small which has given me this much and variance associated with moderate which has given me 0.0004 now what it is saying theoretically if i have to go with divide the larger variance by the smaller variance which is nothing but var of small divided by var of moderate because the small's variance is higher which is giving me 1.63 to be significantly different the ratio needs to be significantly bigger than 1 now it is 1.63 i don't know whether it is significantly bigger than 1 or it is more or less around 1 so this is where i really want to assess whether it is significantly large or not so to assess whether something is significantly large or not i will follow the critical i'll find out the critical value associated with that ratio of variance using the f distribution so i can find out this qf qf is nothing but uh, it will uh, tell me that particular quantile value associated with uh, uh, an alpha value so the critical value associated with that type 1 error so if i am saying i want to be 95% confidence i want a 95% confidence uh, level associated critical value 
then it means my alpha is 1 minus 95% which is 0 0.05 and in case of F test value I am looking at only is it larger so only one side I am looking at which means I will always take alpha by 2 which is 0 0.025 so in my f function, I will always take it as 0 0.075. So what I can very well do, I will find out my qf, which is associated with 0 0.075, uh, sorry, 0 0.975, which is 97.5%, which is equal to alpha by 2 of 2.5%. Then the degrees of freedom for the first one, n n1 minus 1. 382 and the degrees of freedom associated with the second one which is 764. So my critical value in this case comes out as 1.186. So my critical value is 1.186. What does this mean? At alpha equal to 5% and uh, having 383 samples of the first case and 383 samples in the first case and 765 samples in the second case. Whatever is the variance that I have computed, what is the variance that I have computed, variance ratio 1.63, will need to be greater than or equal to 1.186. So if this ratio is actually greater than or equal to 1.186, then I can very well conclude that the variances are significantly different at alpha equal to 5%. Now we have got it as 1.63 which is higher than 1.186. So I can very significantly conclude that the variances between the groups, uh, the small group versus the moderate group, the variances are significantly different. The variance in case of small is much higher. Smaller companies are having a much higher variance compared to the moderate companies. So, the whole thing can very well be executed through a direct test also. In this case, the null hypothesis is going as the two variances are more or less equal. There is no significant difference between the variances of the two groups. So, and the alternate hypothesis, so basically it goes like a null hypothesis is the variance of the first group is same as the variance of the second group. The alternate hypothesis comes out as no, there is a significant difference between the two groups. So, the calculated value, if it is coming out larger than the critical value, the critical value is always computed as QF. I am taking, if, I'm, if I want a alpha as 5%, I will take it as 1 minus alpha by 2. So, which would be like 0.975 degrees of freedom of the first one, degrees of freedom of the second one. So, this would be my critical value for doing my F test. And I will see if my calculated value, which is the variance of the first one divided by the variance of the second one, if it is larger than the critical value, I will reject the null hypothesis make my decision in favor of the alternate hypothesis saying the variances are very much different. Uh, so uh, at 5% significance level, uh, the consistency between the two is much different. And at the same time, I can very well use the p-value as well corresponding uh, instead of uh, going with uh, QF and based on that trying to uh, find it out, I can very well uh, find out my p-value which I can compute because this is a two-sided kind of a test. First thing is, I'll take it as double of 1 minus PF, whatever is the ratio that I have got, 1.63, and the degrees of freedom of the first one, 382, the degrees of freedom of the second one. So this will give me what is the p-value associated with this particular test which is saying 1.15 into 10 to the power of minus 8. So, which is much, much lesser than 0 0.05. So, this is also less than 0 0.05. So, I can very well reject the null hypothesis. So, this is how I compute the p-value in case of uh, the F test. I will find out the resulting probability uh, will have a two-tailed nature. So, that is where I am doing a doubling.
and I'll make it as 1 minus PF times whatever the calculated value that I have got, comma degrees of freedom of the first one, degrees of freedom of the second one. So the P value is less than 0 0.05. I'll reject the null hypothesis and I take my decision in favor of the alternate hypothesis. Now, why do we really compute the variances here? Why are we comparing the variances? Now, the main assumption here is if the variances are significantly different, then I cannot compare the means of the two groups using the t-distribution. There is one more important uh, logical point that you have to understand. If the variances are significantly different, which is what is the case here between the small and the medium, moderate, I am seeing that uh, the, so the variances are significantly different. If the variances are significantly different, then I should not use the t-test to compare the means between the two groups. So that is one more reason why we should really compare the, compare the variances first because the t-test I can't use directly if the variances between the groups are significantly different. So now we can very well, uh, the same process that we have done manually, we can very well use var.test function wherein I can give the two inputs so I'll say var dot test. I'll give the input as small comma moderate. I'll give the two variables small and moderate. So it is doing an f test, comparing the variances. The data that it has taken is small and moderate. The f value that it has got is 1.638. That is what we have got through our computation as well. The degrees of freedom for the numerator is 382, one lesser. The degrees of freedom for the denominator is 764, 1 less than 765. The p-value came out as 1.155 into 10 to the power of minus 8. This is what we have got through our computation using this formula 2 into 1 minus pf. The alternate hypothesis here is saying true ratio of variance is not equal to 1. So the variances are not uh, equal. There is a significant difference between the two variances. Now we could see that the ratio of variances is 1.63 and the 95% confidence interval for this variances ratio is 1.38 to 1.95. So whatever is the samples that are changing, we are 95% confidence that the, the ratio of their variances if I am giving if I am giving a range of 1.38 and 1.95 the true ratio of their variances, I'm sure with 95% confidence, it will be within this range itself. There is only a 5% chance that uh, my estimate will not contain the variant, uh, ratio of the variances between the two populations, but I'm 95% confident that whatever is the range that I'm giving, it will definitely contain the ratio of the variances between the two groups. Now, we, what we have to understand here is this variance dot test is highly sensitive to the outliers. We have to be very careful from that perspective. The var dot test is very much highly sensitive to the outliers. So, we have to use it with care. Then, when we are working with the variances, the other important aspect that we have to focus on is homoscedasticity. Right. So basically, I want to really assess whether the variance is differing significantly from sample to sample. If I am changing the sample, is my variance drastically uh, getting differed or is it more or less similar? So I am looking at to how much extent the variance is overall constant. If I change one set of data versus other set of data from the same population, is the variance more or less similar or do I observe much drastical differences across the variances? So this is very important, right? We have to really uh, focus on computing uh, the homoscedasticity associated with the data because there are lots of applications like when I'm using regression, I make a big assumption that the variances are more or less constant. 
when i am doing anova which we would be discussing in the couple of uh, sessions after this there also we are making one big assumption that the variances are more or less constant and they are they are not differing drastically from sample to sample so it's very important for us to know whether the variances are more or less constant from sample to sample or there is a drastic difference across the variances from sample to sample so so for comparing the variances of the two samples i can also use the fisher's f test write the fisher's f test which we have uh, used var dot test if i'm uh, if i'm focusing more on comparing the variances across the two samples the fisher's f test is more or less uh, uh, more or less uh, appropriate which we have used just now but if i am having multiple samples i can very well focus on going with bartlett test or the plinger killeen test these are some of the tests that i can go with if i am having multiple samples so let's say i am having different kinds of groups out here right so we have a, a small group moderate group again if i am going with the price as a data right so when i am going with the price as a data i have uh, uh, within this price let me just take uh, the head of price so we have these many uh, columns groups wise we have three groups small medium and big so we 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 can very well uh, look at uh, the factors so these are uh, groups is typically a factor with three levels and uh, i can very well uh, find out the variance of the change one associated with each of the groups so probably let me try a t apply where i'll try to find out the variance uh, of the change one so probably let me attach the price so that i don't need to use the dollar every time i'll attach the price so that now if i am looking at uh, names of the price these are the headings what i'll do is change dot one so i'll do a t apply wherein i will try to compute the variance of this change dot one across the different groups let me look at the change dot one across the different groups wherein i'm computing the variance for each of the groups so my t apply is actually computing the variance of each of the groups right so for the big the variance is around 0.0007 the moderate the variance is around 0.0004 and for the small also it's looking like the variance is around 0.0007 so now i can very well perform the bartlett test across the groups so let me do bartlett dot test wherein i am considering the groups so the first input that i have to give to this uh, bartlett dot test is my change dot one the variable which i am trying to compare and the groups according to across which i have to compare is the groups so i am doing a bartlett test like this across each of the groups i am looking at the homogeneity of the variance so the bartlett test right wherein i am looking at the variances across uh, variance of uh, change dot one across the various groups which is coming out that the bartlett uh, k squared is coming out as 54.535 right when i am taking the bartlett test it is coming out as 54.535 this is the bartlett k squared and the degrees of freedom is 2 because we have three groups that we have focused on and the p value is coming out as 1.439 into 10 to the power of minus 12 even the bartlett test also makes a kind of a null hypothesis that the variances across all the groups are more or less uniform right the bartlett test is making a simple assumption 
that the variances are more or less uniform and the alternate hypothesis says no there is a significant difference at least in one of the group's variance and if I am looking at the p-value it is 1.439 10 to the power of minus 12 less than 0 0.05 and because of which I can make a conclusion that the variances are not uniform across the groups at least uh, in one of the groups the variance is significantly different from the rest. So if the variances are not uniform across the groups I cannot really go ahead with my regression or I can't use my ANOVA for this uh, uh, for, for uh, comparing the means across these groups because the variances are not more or less uniform. Now the same logic I can go with uh, Flickner dot test. I'll use another test called Flickner dot test. Again doing the same thing change dot one. I'm trying to compare it across the groups. I'm using change dot one. I'm trying to compare it across the groups. Now here also the the way it is computing here it is computing based on the k squared whereas here it is computing based on the chi squared. The chi squared value is 23.173 per the Pligner and along with that the p value is coming out as 9.289 into 10 to the power of minus 6. Even this also goes with the same set of assumptions. The variance across the groups is more or less uniform is the null hypothesis. No, the variances are different across the groups is the alternate hypothesis. So because the p-value is less than 0 0.05, I can very well say that the means are not, uh, uh, I can very well say that the variances are not uniform across the groups. There is a difference in the way, in the variances across these small, medium and big as a company. So the Flickner test is also giving that there is a significant difference between the variances. Now, if you see a few important points here, the Fisher's F test, where we have computed it with respect to uh, two variables, two samples versus uh, the Bartlett test when you have worked with uh, three or more kind of samples. We need to understand that they are all sensitive to outliers. Whereas the pligner killing test is actually a non-parametric test. Right? The Fisher and Bartlett test, they are all parametric tests. So they are very much sensitive to outliers. Whereas the Fligner test is not sensitive to outliers because it is not uh, relying more on the parameters. It's not computing the mean, etc. It is using the ranks of the absolute values rather than the actual values. So that's one of the reasons, especially if there are too many uh, uh, outliers kind of thing in my data. If I have to compare the variances, I better use fligner killian test rather than relying on Fisher test or Bartlett kind of a test. So especially if I have too much of data which is deviating a lot from normality, if I have to compare the variances across the groups, I prefer more of a fligner killian test rather than relying on Fisher or Bartlett test. Right? So this is one more important aspect that we need to be uh, comfortable with. And now, uh, we can actually look at the plot across the groups. So, when, when uh, in this case itself, I can think of actually creating a quick set of plots so that I can compare the uh, I can compare the stuff. So let me create a quick model across the groups. Right? I want to create a simple model wherein I am looking at the linear regression model between my various uh, changes, change dot one, across the various uh, groups, which is my groups. I want to really look at creating a model like this and if I am doing a plotting of the model right I could see the pattern of the residuals if you see the pattern of the residuals in this case 
right it would have been better if i had uh, plotted uh, all four in one single stuff so let me close this so let me uh, put mf pro right par par equal to mf pro c2 comma 2 so that i'll get two rows two columns right or probably par mf pro is equal to c2 comma 2 which will give me a 2 by 2 kind of a space then i'll try to plot the model so that i get all of them in one single chart itself because the regression model gives me four different outputs now you could see here variation wise so this is what is uh, happening with uh, the three different groups right the variance is residuals when you are looking at there are some values which are very much the outliers the data of the residuals is not normal you see a big deviation from normality that is coming out with the residuals so from these you could clearly see we will we'll discuss about the regression plot in detail at a later part but what we could quickly see here is residuals versus the fitted values uh, there is a lot of deviation across the groups and along with this also if you see the normality of the residuals it is much much uh, away from normal if it is on this dotted line then it is normal but you see things moving away from the dotted line too much which means the data is not uh, much closer to normal so in this case if i have to compare the variances between the groups it would have been better that i rely on uh, flignor.test uh, as my data is more and more uh, uh, non-normal in terms of residuals and uh, when I am uh, looking at uh, the Flickner test it is there is no compelling evidence for non-constant here there is a lot of uh, difference in the uh, variances so which means I could very well conclude that the variances across the groups are not uniform so if the variances across the groups are not uniform as we have already discussed earlier we can't use the t-test to compare the means across the groups. Now, so once we know uh, different kinds of tests associated with uh, working with the variances, the next aspect that we are getting in is comparison of the means across the groups. So, the common question that is coming out is how likely is that our two sample means so when I am taking a, a population 1 and population 2, I have computed uh, the, I have taken a sample 1 out of it, I have taken a sample 2 out of it and I am taking the mean of this mu1, I am taking the mean of this mu2. How likely is that our two sample means drawn from two different populations have the same average? So if they are highly likely, then I can make a conclusion that the two sample means are not significantly different. But if they are very less likely, then I'll say that there is a significant difference between the means of these two groups. So the probability that the two samples are drawn from the sample populations having the same mean, if it is very low, then I can very well say that these two means are significantly different. So I can say with a very good high amount of confidence that the means between these two groups of data are significantly different from each other. Now if I have to do some kind of real testing for comparing the means and saying whether the means are significantly different or not, we can employ one of these two tests. One a student t-test especially when the samples are very much independent. The variances across the groups are constant for which I can very well test using the F dot or var dot test which is the Fisher F test. So I will compare the variances if the variances are constant then I can very well use the T test. Right? If the variances are not constant I should not rely on the T test and the error should be normally distributed if the errors are very much deviating from normal also then also i cannot use the t test any of these things violating it's better that i rely on the non parametric test to compare the means of the two groups 
wherein I would be using the Wilcoxon's rank sum test, especially if it is sufficient that the samples are independent. I don't need anything about the uh, variance between the groups. Is it constant or not? And I also really know, don't bother about whether the error terms are normally distributed or not. So because of that reason, the student t-test is having a much higher level of uh, the Wilcoxon sign test is a much appropriate test if my data is not fitting into any of these kind of groups. All right. Now, getting started with the student's t-test. Now. Let's look at uh, the student t-test in case the variances had been equal, in case there are not too many outliers in the data. I can think of going ahead with the student t-test, though in this case I should not use it, but from the point of uh, understanding, let's try to understand how do we execute the student t-test here. If I have to talk about the student t-test, it is one test which has revolutionized the study of small sample statistic, right? Especially if my sample size is much smaller. But of course, in this case, my sample size is much larger. But when, when I have to talk about uh, small sample statistics, probably t-test is one of uh, the most valuable stat, uh, tests that I, I should be performing. So here, the major part is any inference that I am making regarding the means between the samples are made on the basis of sample variance when the population variance is not known. And in many, in almost all the tests that we would be looking at, it's very rare that the population variance is known in many a cases, the population variance will not be known, where may, which means I would be using the sample variance in the places where the population variance is not known. And that can be very comfortably accomplished when I am using the t-test. So the test statistic that we are computing here is based on the number of standard errors. Right? We are talking about uh, the difference between the mean of sample A versus the mean of sample B. What we would typically uh, talk about is by how many standard errors is this different between the two sample means separated. So I am measuring this difference between the two sample means in terms of their standard error of the differences. And let me tell you the standard error of the difference is nothing but if it is only one we said standard error is sigma by root n but if there are two samples the same thing right the variances i will add them the first one is having the variance of sigma 1 squared by n1 the second one is having this variance of sigma 2 squared by n2 so this is my total variance i take the standard deviation giving me the standard error of the total so, uh, I'll use that as SA squared by NA plus SB squared by NB. That is what we are calling as the standard error of the differences. And in case of, uh, see, we, we know this formula, right? Variance of A minus B is nothing but variance of A plus variance of B minus 2 times the covariance between A and B. Now, if the samples are independent, the covariance between them will be zero. So, variance of A minus B is nothing but variance of A plus variance of B. So, I will add up the variances and I will take the square root of the total sum giving me the standard error of the overall difference between the, uh, uh, between the two sample means. So, this is how we do the t-test in this case. Right, t dot test, uh, I can use the direct function t dot test, but if I am going with uh, the typical mechanism, I have to find uh, this way. Probably uh, we can quickly uh, look at the mechanism. Right, we have to go with uh, the sample mean of A. So, uh, let me take uh, 
let me take small so mean of small so this is the sample mean of small I'll take the mean of moderate right we have already created those variables so the so the uh, mean mean uh, uh, return mean uh, change is 0 0.003 in case of small 0 0.007 in case of large then we also had uh, variances right uh, SA squared so the variance of small is this much variance of moderate is this much now I need to find out the SE of the difference which is nothing but SA squared by N1 NA plus SB squared by NB and I have to take the square root of that so SA squared variance of small right variance of small by n1 uh, length of small this is the first one plus s b squared variance of the moderate divided by n b which is the length of moderate so i am adding them up and i am taking the square root of the sum so the SE div, which is the standard error of the difference, is coming out to be this one. Then we have difference of the means. So I'll call it as mean div, which I'm computing as mean of small minus mean of large or mean of moderate. So I'm computing the difference between the means. So I'll get my mean div is minus 0.003. Then I'll take the t value, which is the different, which is the ratio of these two. The mean of the differences, which is this much, divided by the standard error of the difference. So, which is working out to the t value is working out to minus 2.217. And corresponding to this uh, difference, I can get the T value, right, the, the, the critical value, right, I can compute the critical value associated with the T. So, I can very well compute it using the QT, the QT function where I have to specify the alpha, alpha in this case, Again, I'll take it as based on the alpha. If I'm going with a two-tailed test, I will always look at alpha by two, which means I'll take one minus alpha by two in the QT formula. Degrees of freedom will become Na plus Nb minus two. So Na plus Nb minus two. So let me take my QT 0.975 and I'll have to take degrees of freedom is Na plus Nb minus 2 which is length of small plus length of moderate minus 2 that is the degrees of freedom so the QT is computed this way saying 1.962 so the QT is critical value is coming out as 1.962 Whereas my computed T value, I'll only take uh, the modulus of it, which is 2.211. So the modulus of T is greater than the critical value. So I can very well reject the null hypothesis and take my decision in favor of the alternate hypothesis, saying that the means between the two groups are not the same. The means are different. Right? So... That is what, if you quickly uh, look at the null hypothesis, is two populations are having the same mean. I will accept this unless the t value is too large. So, if my computed value is larger than this critical value 1.962, then I will reject the null hypothesis. 
But as long as my computed value is lesser than or equal to 1.962, I will be accepting the null hypothesis itself. And in this case, we are talking of 5% chance of rejecting the null hypothesis. So we are setting the alpha as 5%. So that's where in uh, QT, I am giving 1 minus uh, alpha by 2, which is uh, 0.975. The critical value I have computed using the QT function, where I have uh, given the alpha as 1 minus alpha by 2, which is 0.975 and degrees of freedom is Na plus Nb minus 2. Right, the degrees of freedom is much higher. We see that the T distribution will approximate a normal distribution. So when I'm computing a normal distribution with five alpha equal to five percent, there also we'll get a value more or less closer to this 1.96 itself. So this is one way where I could, uh, if at all I'm using the T test, I can very well compare the difference between the means of the two groups. We also have another way where I can uh, compare the uh, means uh, through graphically. It's better that if I have to compare on a graphical note, I can go with a not option box plot. Right? I'm going with uh, a not option box plot. So wherein I could have very easily, I can take it right from the data itself because I have any of uh, taken it as a price. Uh, I have uh, attached it to the price. So let me see if I can take the box plot directly. Wherein I, I, I can look at all the groups, right? Uh, so I'm uh, taking change dot one across what are the headings here? I am taking the change dot one across the different groups, which are groups, right? I am putting the box plot of change dot one across the groups. Of course, here now we have a two by two uh, place. So probably let me make it one by one par MF row equal to C one comma one so that I'll get the whole graph here itself. Then I'll take the box plot associated with the uh, First, I'll have to give my uh, independent, uh, my quantitative variable, which is change dot one. I'm giving a, a, a formula sign y across all x. My x's are groups. So across the groups, I'm trying to do the plot. Of course, as we said, we want the notch to be true because we are using a box plot with the notches. If required, we can give x label. The x labels are the groups. Right, or the size of the company. I'll call it as size of the company. Y label, I'll call it as change in price. Okay, so let's do the box plot. Now, this is how the box plot is coming out with the notches. Right, if I examine the box plot with the notches here, so this is the notch out here. This is the notch out here. Now, I don't see that the notches are overlapping at all between big and moderate. Whereas between moderate and small, I could see that there is some level of overlap in the notches. But between big and uh, moderate, I don't see any kind of overlap in the notches. So, which is an indicator that there is a significant difference between big and moderate may not be any kind of over difference between mo moderate and small, right? The differences are not coming out that significant between moderate and small. Graphically, I can have this kind of a mechanism. But of course, we need to understand that this is very appropriate to apply only when we are focusing on, only when we are sure that the variances across the groups are more or less equal. So if you look at uh, the variability, Right, both in terms of the range as well as in terms of interquartile range, I could uh, clearly see that it is very, very lesser. Right, this is the the range wise, you could see that there's a, a big difference, whereas the interquartile range only is this much. So, we could uh, clearly see that the ranges are interquartile ranges are more or less equal, 
but you could very well see that the ranges of the values are quite drastically different, which means there is a presence of a few outliers in the data. So that could also create to the difference between the groups. So I am looking at the variability this way. Now, if I have to use t test directly, I could have used t dot test. Right, I could have used t dot test between small and moderate. Now, most of the calculations that we have done manually, you should get the similar kind of values. Right, t value we have got it as minus 2.21. Yes, we also got it as minus 2.21. The direct test also is giving minus 2.21. The degrees of freedom, yes, here it is uh, computed as, okay, here, square root of uh, sigma 1 squared by n1 plus sigma 2 squared by n2. When I am looking at, I am getting the degrees of freedom as that much. And the p-value has worked out to be uh, 0 0.02737. So this is where I can reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is getting uh, rejected because p-value is less than 0 0.05. Alternate hypothesis is true difference in the means is not equal to 0. So the 95% confidence interval uh, for this, okay, the mean of x is 0 0.0037. That is what we have got. And the mean of y is 0 0.0072. So we can say that this is the difference that is existing in the means. But this difference, the 95% confidence interval of the difference is minus 0 0.0066 to minus 0 0.00039. ,000 so what we are saying is I am 95% confident that the difference between the means of the two groups will lie within this range itself. Only a 5% chance that it could be anywhere outside the range. So my range is not capturing uh, the difference of the mean. Whereas I am 95% sure that it will capture the difference of the means. So the p-value uh, is less than 0 0.05. So I am rejecting the null hypothesis. And the confidence interval, if it is uh, containing a zero, then I will not reject the null hypothesis. If it is not containing a zero, then also I can reject the null hypothesis and I can take my decision in favor of the alternate hypothesis. So in case we are using uh, the t-test, this is the way we can uh, do the comparison of the t-test across these two groups. But as we have seen that the variances are significantly different, I will not use the parametric student t-test. I would prefer the non-parametric uh, alternative of the student t-test, which is otherwise called as a Wilcoxon rank sum test. Especially if the errors are non-normal. We have already seen the errors wise. There is a lot of non-normality, right? Even with the data, if we are trying them out, uh, we could have uh, used Shapiro will test to see if my data is normal. So I'll do a Shapiro dot test of small. So which is saying that the p-value is 2.5 in 10 to the power of minus 13. So I'll go with the alternate hypothesis. And the alternate hypothesis is the data is not normal. So in case of Shapiro test uh, for small, uh, it is coming out to be non-normal. Even for moderate also, I can quickly uh, check out the Shapiro test. Even in this case, it is coming out to be non-normal. Even if you want, you can look at the QQ norm associated with small separately. Wherein it is coming out like this. Whereas if you are plotting QQ line with respect to the same small and setting LTY equal to 2, so this is this line is what is the normality related line but my actual plots are way deviating from normality. So this is where I can say that the small data is nowhere close to normal. Even the moderate also I could see that this is how the moderate data is coming out and if I am plotting a, a QQ line for moderate it is working out to be like this. 
even here also we see that there are a lot of values which are deviating from the normal so both of them are non normal and i have also seen that uh, uh, the variances are not uh, equal which we have tested using var dot test so in this case it's better to rely on wilcox uh, the rank sum test if i have to compare the means between the groups now just to understand what happens here both the samples the samples from uh, uh, the small as well as the large both of them are combined and put into one small array right moderate so there is one single array that is created and uh, uh, with the names clearly attached so this belongs to small this belongs to moderate this whole thing is sorted in the ascending order or in the descending order the labels are kept intact now once they are sorted a rank is assigned to all these values so the rank is a combined rank both from small as well as from the moderate now all the ranks are simply added all the ranks are simply added and if there is a tie in the ranks it would be the average rank that would be given and once that average ranks are typically created added we are looking at the significance with respect to the smaller sum of ranks so whichever is the one that is having the smallest sum of ranks that would be compared against the wilcoxon rank sum tables and if that sum is if that sum is uh, lesser uh, uh, than the uh, value that is given in the table then we reject the null hypothesis if that sum is greater than uh, what is given in the table we do not reject the null hypothesis that's a typical process wise doing the stuff so let's see if i have to try it out uh, process wise right we'll take both of them so small moderate i am calling as a, a variable wherein i am considering both small as well as moderate right i am taking small moderate wherein i am combining both small as well as the moderate so if i am looking at uh, the length of sm it should include both the small as well as the moderate 1148 now we have to keep their names intact so that's where i'll use a variable called label wherein i'm repeating right i'm taking a repeating of the word small how many times i should repeat the small depending on whatever is the length of the small i found out the length of the small so let me do this length of small number of times i'll repeat it i'll repeat the small length of small number of times and then i'll repeat moderate i'll repeat moderate length of moderate number of times i'll repeat these things like this okay so so that's how my labels get repeated now i have got the labels now i have got the observations then i can very well say combined rank i'll do a combination of the rank wherein i am finding out the rank associated with sm so for each one i am giving the rank so if you look at the head of a uh, head of combined rank where it will give me the ranks associated with each one of them so the first observation is having a rank of 172 the second one is having 670 and so on now i can now i can simply do a t apply now i'll separate it group wise wherein i am finding out i am having the combined rank i am doing the summation across the labels so i'll say label and sum i am doing the summation across the labels so for moderate the summation is coming out to be 452270 and for small the summation is coming out to be 207256
So that is the summation of the ranks that is coming up. Now I'll take the smaller of these ranks, 207,256 and compare it with respect to my Wilcox uh, uh, rank sum tables. And if this value is lesser than the table value, so the table value is purely based on the sample size of both the group 1 as well as group 2. So if this value, whatever we have computed, 207,256, if it is lesser than the table value, then we reject the null hypothesis and say that the means are significantly different. Otherwise, we will not reject the null hypothesis. Now, the same process we could very easily employ by directly using the Wilcox.text. So, if I say Wilcox.test and if I am using the variable 1 and the variable 2, which is small and moderate. I am just giving the two variables. Finding out the Wilcox test right here, the W, which is what is the critical value. Right here, the critical value is coming out to be 133720, whereas our small computed value is 207256. So, if you see that uh, this is my, our computed value is much higher than this, which is what is resulting in a p value of 1.58%. So, here the p-value is coming out to 1.58% which is lesser than 0 0.05. So, I will take my decision in favor of alternate hypothesis by rejecting the null hypothesis. And the alternate hypothesis is true location shift is not equal to 0. So, there is a definitely a difference in the means across the groups or whatever is the measure of uh, location here. Generally, median is the measure of location here. We say that the location differences between the two groups is significantly different. So, that is what is performed by a Wilcox test. Of course, a few important points we have to understand here. It uses a normal approximation algorithm to find out the Z value. And from this Z value, it will compute the P value, the probability of with which the null hypothesis may have to be accepted. So, the probability with, uh, uh, with I can say that the means of both the groups are same is 1.58% less than 0 0.05. So, I can very well take my decision in favor of rejecting the null hypothesis and taking the decision in favor of the alternate hypothesis. So, that is how we will work with Wilcoxon rank sum test. All right. So, if I have to quickly compare between the t-test and Wilcoxon Ransom test. Few important points. Wilcoxon Ransom test is a non-parametric test which is much more appropriate than the t-test especially if my errors are non-normal. If my data is too much deviating from normality, it is better that I employ Wilcoxon Ransom test rather than relying on the t-test. But one more point we have to be uh, understanding in this context is any non-parametric test that I am performing, especially if my errors are very much normal, my data is fully normally distributed, non-parametric test is only around 95% as powerful as the t-test. So when the data is more and more normal, it is better to engage a t-test but when you see too much of deviation from normality, it is better to engage a Wilcoxon rank sum test rather than going ahead with a parametric test like a t-test. And another positive aspect of uh, Wilcoxon or any non-parametric test is it is more powerful than the t-test, especially if there are too many outliers in the data. To make sufficient conclusions regarding the mean, Better to use a Wilcoxon rank sum test rather than relying on the t-test, especially if there are too many outliers in the data. So, because of various reasons, we can very well say the Wilcoxon test is more and more conservative. So, if a difference is, if you find that the difference is significant under the Wilcoxon test, you will find that it would definitely be even more significant under the t-test. So, that is one of the more reasons probably I can rely more on the Wilcoxon test because it is much more conservative compared to the t-test. 
So this is how we focus on comparing the means between the groups using the either the Wilcoxon test or even the T test. Now, now that we are clear on the testing between the two groups which are independent, the next aspect that we would focus on is if the groups are not independent, if they are very much paired. So which means I am expecting some level of correlation between the two groups. So either they are made on the same individual or taken from the same location. So probably it would have been better if I can take the data wherein I take the two days price, yesterday's and today's. Right? Probably I will take it that way itself. If you look at uh, the price data, we have close and previous close for the same company. So that is what it means. So we are expecting a correlation between the two measurements. Let me take the correlation between close, comma, pre-close. They are not independent. They have almost 0.9999 correlation. 99.99% correlation is existing between them. So we are expecting a good amount of correlation between the two measurements because they are either made on the same individual, which is the same company. Both the data are belonging to the same company are taken from the same location. So here, yesterday's price versus the today's price. That's the only thing I'm looking at. So when I want to really test the means between those two groups, which are like uh, made on the same, which are not independent samples, but they are paid samples. So in that case, normally speaking, the difference is if you were, when we were computing the variance of A minus B earlier, we expanded it as variance of A plus variance of B minus 2 into covariance between A and B. And if the variables are very much independent, we said this term is 0. So variance of A minus B is nothing but variance of A plus variance of B. This is what we have used for computing the difference between the means. But here we have to understand this is not 0 because they are not independent uh, samples. They are paired samples. So I cannot directly remove the two times covariance between A and B. And if the higher is the covariance between A and B, I could see that the variance of A minus B is coming down drastically. So the positive covariance is reducing the variance of the differences. So this means by making the assumption regarding the independence, probably my results of the difference between the means are very much different from bringing in the covariance aspect into that data. So this is where we talk about if I have to really do this exercise when the variables are very much uh, closely, when the vari variables are not independent, I should do a t-test between the close as well as pre-close. If I do it uh, just as two independent entities, let's see the difference. If I take them as independent and do a t-test, so it is coming out that, okay, close versus previous close, the p-value is 0.9478, right, which is greater than 0 0.05. So I will not reject the null hypothesis. I can very well say that the means of both the groups are more or less similar. Because the mean of x is coming out to 467, the mean of y is coming out to 463. So I am able to say that the means are not drastically different between the close and the previous close. But this computation has very much assumed that close and previous close are completely independent. There is no relationship between these two set of observations. Whereas, if I say no, they are not independent, they are very much paired, then it's better that I execute the same test, close and previous, uh, paired close, uh, sorry, previous close, where I will set one additional variable called equal to true. Now, if I do this test, 
now you see the difference right the p value came out to be 2.055 into 10 to the power of minus 9 which means you have rejected the null hypothesis earlier it was saying that the difference is significant now it is uh, differences were not significant between the two means because it has assumed that both of them are independent but here it did not assume them to be independent here it has taken them to be dependent which is actually it has taken the difference between the pairs and corresponding to the differences between the pairs a single sample t-test has been performed what has actually happened is if you look at this data okay I'll try to compute diff 1 I'll call it as close minus brave close Right, I have computed dip 1 and uh, now I am doing a t dot test associated with dip 1. This is what has actually happened. Now, this is this is how. So, I am taking the difference separately and I am performing the t test 1. One sample t test instead of a two sample t test. Now, you could see the difference is 4.07. Which is what is correct, 467, 463, the mean difference is 4.07, but 95% confidence interval is only between 2.74 and 5.39. So, because 0 is not there in the confidence interval, I have rejected the null hypothesis and I have made my decision in favor of alternate. So, we have to very clearly understand what is the context for our, uh, uh, what kind of uh, t-test I have to perform. Is it uh, more associated with uh, assuming independence between the variables or should I look at having a kind of dependency between the variables, right? So, they based on that, I should go either with a normal t-test or I should take that the pairing between them is true, paired sample t-test, all right? Now, let's look at uh, if I have to compare two proportions of two different data sets, right? I want to really see what is the proportion if I want to compare depending on the number of successes of the first group and the total number of elements in the first group. Similarly, I want to compare the successes in the second group with the total number of elements in the second group. So, I can do a two sample test for equality of proportions with continuity correction. That is what is executed through a prop dot test. So, from this data, let's say I want to create a test saying, okay, I have a small as well as I have a big or I have moderate. Now, within this, I really want to see whether the numbers of a positive are more or less similar across both the groups or not, right? Uh, whichever are the number of companies for which the, the positive is there, I really want to see. So, here if you see the price, Let's look at the head of this price. So, we see that, uh, let me close this up. We see that uh, we have groups moderate, small, big. The change is good, average and poor. Now, what I really want to see is, is the good, right? Good if I am calling it as a success. I really want to see whether the proportion of good is equal across the moderate as well as the small or that is not the case. So, this is where I really want to break this data, split this data into groups, right? So, I want to really uh, find out for each of the groups what is the change. So, I will create a small table first. Right, wherein I am taking groups, comma, change. So, I will get, okay, in this group, big 
average is 175, good is 154, poor is 54. Whereas in moderate, 417 is average, 149 is good, 199 is poor. So that is how the groups and change are related. Now what I really want to see is, is the proportion of good, right, is the proportion of good uniform across the small companies versus the moderate companies. So this is where I'll use the prop dot test, right? I'm taking two different vectors, wherein I'm taking number of successes for each of the groups and sample sizes of the groups. So I'll do a prop dot test. So as my question is good, so I'm more bothered about this being my good. So good, I want to compare between the moderate group as well as the small group. So in the moderate group, I have 149 good and in the small I have 80 good okay so I am taking this as one vector then I also need to take the total number of elements in both the groups so in case of moderate what are the total number of elements 417 plus 149 plus 199 so comes out as 348 and uh, 348 plus 417 making it 765 whereas uh, in case of small it is 210 plus 173 making it 383 so this is the sizes and uh, I'm trying to compare uh, whether 149 out of 765 versus 80 out of 383 are they having similar kind of proportions or not? Are the proportions more or less uniform across the groups or not? Now this is what is a two sample test for equality of proportions with continuity correction across these two groups. So we are saying the first group is having 149 successes out of 765. The second group is having 80 successes out of 383. So this is actually uh, performed through an x squared whose value is 0.23 and degrees of freedom is nothing but n uh, in this case because it's a two groups row minus one into column minus one which is always one the p value is coming out to 0.6272 which is greater than 0 0.05. So the null hypothesis here is the proportions are uniform p1 is equal to p2 the proportion between the two groups is uniform whereas the alternate hypothesis says no they are not uniform there is a difference in the proportions across the groups so the p value is 0.6272 which is greater than 0 0.05 so i cannot reject the null hypothesis i have to go with the null hypothesis itself here saying that the proportions are more or less equal across the group and the 95% confidence interval of the proportion is minus 0 0.065, the difference between the proportions. It's saying it could be anywhere between minus 0 0.065 to 0 0.037. And because 0 is there as a part of the interval, I cannot reject the null hypothesis. So based on the p-value also, I cannot reject the null hypothesis. Based on the 95% confidence interval also, I cannot reject the null hypothesis. If I am looking at the proportions, it is 19.47% in the first case, it is 20.88% in the second case. But these proportions are not that significantly different. That is what is being given by our prop dot test. So in small samples, even a small change will have big effects. So when I am making a conclusion whether the proportions are significantly different or not, we look at the p-values and based on the p-values we are making our conclusions, right? Now, the next topic which we are bringing in in this context which is one of the most important uh, aspects, especially working with contingency tables. We call them as chi-squared contingency tables wherein we are looking at in all these exercises we are focusing on two two columns of data and two columns need to be categorical either nominal or ordinal 
two categorical columns of data, generally nominal data. So we are talking about uh, wherever the statistical information is coming in the form of counts. A lot of places we will be doing the countings of the data. So wherever we are doing the countings across the groups, and I really want to assess uh, the uniformities of the counts across different kinds of groups, we will bring in uh, the contingency table. So if you see the definition of the contingency table, just like this table which we have computed some time back, this table, this is what we call as a contingency table. It shows the counts, how many times each of the contingencies, when I say contingencies, all the possible values in, in the context of statistics, a contingency is nothing but all the possible set of values. So what it is saying is, it shows the counts of how many times each of these contingencies actually happened in a particular sample. So that is what we are computing and a simple table on one column or more columns will create a contingency table like this. So we have the groups big, moderate, small. We have the changes, average, good, poor. And a tabulation of the values like this is what we are creating as a contingency table. Now, generally what we are more interested in looking at is, are these proportions more or less uniform across the groups? Means is the distribution of average, good, poor, uniform across each of the groups. I really want to assess that part. Right? So, is there some kind of a bias? Means, probably is it like uh, uh, more number of average are there, uh, more number of good are there in uh, big group, more poors are there in small group. Do I have such kind of partialities? Or the proportions are more or less uniform across the groups? Now, that is the typical uh, business requirement that we are assessing through this contingency table analysis. So, in this case, in all these, when we are doing our testing, we require a model which predicts the expected frequencies. Right? These are our observed frequencies. So, 175 average, I mean, big companies had an average change compared to yesterday. 154 big companies had a good change and only 54 big companies had a poor change yesterday. So, we are having those as observed values. Now, if I have to say whether the proportions are uniform across the groups or not, I can, I have to first come out with what are the expected frequencies in each of the groups. And this expected frequencies are computed based on the assumption that the variables are independent. So, what it means is the joint probability, right, typically this is the joint probability, 175 out of 1500 and 175 out of 1531, 175 out of 1531, that's the joint probability of occurrence of big and average. Now, what we say is this should be the product of the joint, uh, the marginal probability of big as well as the marginal probability of average. Let's see the marginal probability of big, 175 plus 154, 329, plus 54, 329 plus 54, 383. So, 383 divided by 1531. So, that is the marginal probability of big. I need the marginal probability of average, which is 175 plus 173, 348, 348 plus 417, 805. So, I'll take it as 805 divided by 1531. So, this is the marginal probability of uh, average. Now, what we say is if they are independent, if they are independent, the marginal probability 0.11 should be equal to the product of, sorry, the joint probability 
should be equal to the product of the marginal probabilities. So I am taking it as 0.25 multiplied by 0.52. So which is making it 0.13. So if they are independent, the joint probability should be equal to 0.13. Now what we generally do is we will take this and multiply it with 1531, making it around 201. Now what we say is the expected expected number of big companies that should fall into average is 201. Like that I can fill up this table. So the table filling is typically done through this mechanism, the joint under the assumption that the joint probability is the product of individual marginal probabilities. So the expected frequency in the each cell is coming out as the row total, right? That is the row total we have taken as eight, uh, 383 multiplied by the column total, which is uh, 805 divided by the grand total, which is uh, 1531. So that way we will fill the expected frequencies for each of the groups. So what we have is, we have a contingency table. Here in this case, it's a 3 by 3 contingency table. This 3 by 3 contingency table is having the observed values. We also will create another 3 by 3 contingency values with respect to expected values. And now if I have to see whether the observed values are significantly different from the expected values or not, we are typically using different kinds of tests. And within them, the most common ones are the Pearson chi-squared test, right? One of the most heavily used kind of a test. But you can also use a G-test, which we will talk about and even the Fisher's exact test. The Fisher's exact test is used in uh, a couple of special cases which I would be uh, talking of, but more commonly used kind of tests in this kind of cases, especially when we are comparing the actual observed frequencies with respect to expected frequencies of each of the groups. So the way the Pearson chi-squared is computed is we find out the expected values of each of the uh, nine groups, right? We made it as a 3 by 3 contingency table. So, we will get the expected frequencies for each of them. And the way they are obtained is, we get the row total multiplied by column total divided by the grand total. So, using this formula, we will update the expected frequencies for each of the groups. We also have the observed frequencies for each of the uh, each of the uh, row column intersections. So we will compute the chi squared as observed minus expected whole squared divided by expected. Right? If I have to uh, do this uh, process uh, manually, so these are my observed values. Right, the expected we know, uh, probably we will directly use them, otherwise I will show it in Excel for your understanding. Right, we will do it in R as well. So, here we have big, moderate and small. And here I am putting average, good and poor, right? Uh, so let me put them in two different columns. Now, the numbers are 175, 417 and 173. Whereas here they are 154, 149 and 80. Whereas here it is 54, 199 and 130. So these are my observed values. So I will create my expected values also here. Right, I will create the expected values. So, for creating the expected values, let me take all the column totals as well as all the row totals. So, okay, there is some calculation mistake, I suppose, earlier. But yes, so these are my column totals. These are my row totals. 
and this is my grand total. So my grand total is 1531, right? So that's how the, the, the values came up. Now what I want to really find out is the average. So this one, if I have to compute, I'll take it as row total, right? Because I want always the sixth row here. So I'll take, freeze the sixth row, row total, multiplied by the column total. So this is where I want to freeze the E column. So that's where let me put a dollar out here. This divided by the overall total. So this is saying this should be around 191. And if I am expanding things, this is how the 1531 is getting distributed. 191, 382, 191, so on. So these are my actuals. These are my expected frequencies. Now the question comes, are the expected quite different from actuals or not? Right? So this is where I will compute my chi-squared statistics which comes out as observed minus expected whole squared by expected. So for each of them, I will find out observed minus expected whole squared divided by expected. So for all the nine columns, nine cells, I will try finding that value. This is what is the value observed minus expected whole squared divided by expected. So I can add all of them and that is what we are calling it as the table chi-squared value or, or the computed chi-squared value. So the computed chi-squared value is 84.4. Now. I have to find out the critical value and in this case if I have to find out uh, the critical value I require the degrees of freedom which uh, in this uh, contingency table case degrees of freedom is row minus 1 into column minus 1. So we have 3 rows we have 3 columns so the degrees of freedom is 3 minus 1 into 3 minus 1 so it's a 4 degrees of freedom and degree of certainty I have to go with the alpha value right so here I will take uh, if alpha is 5% then in the sky squared input I will take it as 0.95 which is 1 minus alpha is what I will take while computing my chi squared value so probably in R what I can very well do is Q chi squared I will try to find out Q chi squared I will try to find out wherein 0.95 which is 1 minus alpha and degrees of freedom is 4. So the critical value is coming out to 9.48 for this example. The critical value is coming out to 9.48 whereas we have computed the value the computed value is almost 84.4 the chi-squared value 84.4 so, if the computed value is greater than the critical value, uh, I am much greater than the critical value, I will reject the null hypothesis and I will take my decision in favor of alternate hypothesis. And my null hypothesis in this case is, the, there is uniformity right uh, across the groups in terms of the proportion. The proportions are more or less uniform across the groups. But, uh, which means all the groups are independent. There is no bias of the uh, change across the groups. Whereas the alternate hypothesis says, no, there is no uniformity in the proportions across the groups. They are significantly different. So in this case, I have to say that the proportions are significantly different across the groups. So because the null hypothesis is getting uh, rejected, uh, then I have to really see which groups are having what what is the kind of that significance difference that is present across the groups? So probably if I really see the proportions across each of the groups, right? I am dividing each of the value with their corresponding totals, right? Just to see the proportion. So here the proportions are 45, 40, 14. Whereas if you look at in the other groups, Look at the percentages. So in case of big, 
the the distribution is 45% of them are average 40% of them are good but only 14% of them are poor but if you look at the moderate category almost 54% of them are average only 19% of them are good but 26% of them are poor on the small side also you could see 20% of them are good but 33.94% of them are poor so you could clearly see that the proportions are more different right whereas where the bigs are more towards average and good the the smalls are more towards good and poor so that is where the proportions are not uniform across the group which is what is being concluded by my pearson chi squared also now if i have to really go ahead with assessing this chi squared i have already defined the counts as a matrix now whatever the counts that we have got the table is there i can directly uh, give the table as an input no issues right it will compare the observed and the expected frequencies so i can say chi squared dot test and i'll give my table as the input chi squared dot test i'll give table as the input so the chi squared test is performed so you see the chi squared value is 84.4 that is what we have got as well when we did it in excel we got 84.4 degrees of freedom is 4 the p value is showing 2.2 into 10 to the power of minus 16 which is less than 0.05 so i'll make my decision uh, wherein i am rejecting the null hypothesis making my decision in favor of the alternate hypothesis so that is how the uh, that is how i can execute it in uh, uh, r i directly give chi square dot uh, test and i give the a table of counts that are coming out as the input wherein the chi square uh, would be uh, performed and the appropriate uh, inference could be given to us and uh, if there are uh, only 2 by 2 matrix by default the eights correction also would be performed because uh, in general it is assumed that if it is a 2 by 2 table the size could be much much uh, smaller fitting it uh, to a particular distribution uh, chi square distribution uh, would not be appropriate so that's where some kind of a correction is typically performed before the chi square uh, allocation is done so but the general formula that we are uh, using general function that we are using to test the independence across the groups is the chi square dot test if the p value is less than 0.05 then we cannot say that the groups are independent there is some kind of uh, change in the difference in the proportions across the different groups and if i have to see which ones and uh, what is the kind of a change probably i have to go and uh, examine the proportions of each of the groups separately then similarly we have another test just like a pearson chi square test we have another test which is called as a g test of contingency so it is also an evidence of the non independence between the variables just like the way we have used the chi square the only difference that comes out is the formula is different instead of doing observed minus expected whole squared by expected here we will take it as observed multiplied by logarithm of observed by expected and we multiply it by 2 so if you try the same process in excel here i'll uh, take it as Uh, i'll take it as observed multiplied first let me compute the observed multiplied by logarithm of observed by logarithm of observed divided by expected right so this is what is the computation observed multiplied by logarithm of observed divided by expected we are doing it for all these values and we are adding it up and multiplying it with 2 to get my g value so to compute the g we say 2 multiplied by the summation of all these values so g is coming out to 82
This is again done the same way. We are comparing it with the chi-square distribution with r minus 1, t minus r minus 1, c minus 1 degrees of freedom itself. So the critical value will still remain the same. Critical value is that 9 point something that we have got. 9.487 is my critical value. So I am comparing this 90, uh, 82 something with this critical value. If the calculated value is higher than the critical value, I am rejecting the null hypothesis of independence. And I am saying there is some level of uh, dependency uh, between the groups, which means the proportions are not uniform across the groups. There is some kind of a bias in the proportions across the three groups. And uh, in some cases, instead of taking uniform probability across the groups, I can also uh, look at different probabilities across different groups by specifying P equal to. Let's say if I'm, if I want, uh, okay, first, first group containing 30% of the observation, second group only 20, 40, third group having 40 and fourth group having 10, I can specify what is the kind of proportions I want across the different groups. And based on that also, I can uh, really uh, uh, compute uh, the chi-squared value and perform a chi-squared test. Okay, this part on the table we have already tested. I really don't need this activity again. Probably you can take it as an exercise because we have already uh, created a contingency table using the table function. And that table function only I have given as input to the chi-squared uh, distribution, chi-squared test. So that is what we are uh, doing in this exercise. So probably uh, you can uh, simulate 100 simulations of throwing a six-sided dice and use the table to count the number of times each. So probably if required, let's quickly execute it. So I'll take x, which is called as I'm sampling 1 to 6, right, wherein I'm creating 100 samples where I am setting replace is equal to true. Replace equal to true means I can repick the same values as well. So my x is coming out to be this. So I am doing a table of x. So the table is showing that there are 21s, 21 2s, 23, 22 3s, only 9 4s and so on. Now, if I really want to uh, look out for a chi-square test, then I am performing, saying whether these are all uniform or there is a significant difference in the number of ways each of these observations have come out. So that is where I can look out for the chi-square test and the input wise I am giving the table itself as the input, which is saying that the chi-square value is 8.36 and the p-value is 0.13 greater than 0 0.05, so I cannot reject the null hypothesis. I can say that across the group, the proportions are more or less uniform. But again, within this itself, if I want to differentiate different p-values for each one of them, so that is where I'll give p equal to, by default, it will take 1 by 6 for all of them. But if I am setting my p's, okay, let's say for... Uh, Three of them, I'll set it as uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Then for the next two of them, I'll set it as 0 0.2, 0 0.2. And for the last one, I'll set it as 0 0.3. Let's say these are the probabilities that I'm setting, which should be the values across the table. In that case, when I'm running it, I could see that the chi-squared value is 54 because the expected values are actually computed based on these percentages or probability. So the first one, there should be only 10 occurrences because it's 0.1. The second one also, there should be 10 occurrences, 2. 3 should come again, 10 occurrences. 4 should come, 20 occurrences. 5 should come, 20 occurrences. And 6 should come, 30 occurrences. So based on that, if I am looking at it is coming out that the probability is 1.952 into 10 to the power of minus 10, much lesser than 0 0.05. So I can very well reject my null hypothesis and I can take my decision in favor of the alternate day.
So I can very well change the probabilities across the groups where the uniformity will not be taken into consideration or uh, I can very well uh, give the table as an input for typically performing these kind of uh, computations and the difference in the computations as well. Then the next aspect that we are looking at here is looking at the contingency tables, especially if the frequencies are very, very small. In that case, I should not rely, especially if the expected frequency for any of the group is less than 5. In this example, that has not occurred, so we don't need to bother too much about it. But wherever we come across the situation where the expected frequency of any of the groups is less than 5, then it's not appropriate to use the Pearson chi-square test or even the G test. Right again, as a part of uh, the good practice, if at all you are ending up with an expected frequency of any of the groups to be less than 5, we should not use a Pearson chi-square test or a G test. Right, it's not appropriate because uh, the small expected values will inflate the value of the test statistic because we are doing a square there or in case of Pearson chi-squared, observed minus expected whole squared by expected. If expected is a very small value, the chi-squared value will go up like anything. Similarly, uh, we do uh, observed into logarithm of observed by expected. If expected is very small, again that ratio will be much higher and overall value will be inflated very high. So this is where I cannot really uh, rely on the chi-square distribution altogether. That is uh, in those kind of cases, it's better that we rely on Fisher dot test rather than going ahead with uh, the chi-square test. Uh, as such. So, we can uh, very well uh, give the Fisher dot test to slightly improvise our test. Of course, in this case, may not have any big change. Right, I am giving the Fisher dot test. I can take the table of groups comma change. Error is, so you could see error is, is because uh, too small for this kind of a problem. So I have to increase the size of the workspace. So for the chi-square test, especially when I'm uh, looking at, uh, in case of Fisher dot test, I am looking at uh, values where the small size, very, very small values are coming up as a part of the expected. Then there is a Fisher's correction that can happen based on which I'll get a much different kind of input. Otherwise, I can typically uh, give the inputs directly. Let me try to give the columns directly, fisher.test. So, let me give the inputs instead of table. I'll directly uh, give it as groups, comma, uh, what is the other one? Change. Still, so uh, one, if we have the frequency to be much, much uh, lower, then the Fisher test can perform much appropriate. All right. So it can be used with matrices of any size. Right, argument is a matrix containing the count of all contingencies, just like the way we have provided. Or you can give it as two vectors containing the factor levels instead of a two-dimensional. So I have given uh, even the uh, vectors, two different uh, vectors. One is groups, the other one is change. I can very well use them with matrices of any kind of a, of any kind of a size as well. So if your uh, sample size is much, much smaller, if the expected uh, frequency of any of the groups is very small, then Fisher's test will come in much more uh, handy compared to uh, uh, compared to using a Pearson chi-square test or probably relying on a G-test as well, right? Now, once we are done with understanding the relationships between two categorical variables, we will move towards our next topic wherein we are looking at the relationship between two continuous variables. So, 
the concept that we are talking of is correlation and covariance which talk about the depth of relationship between the two continuous variables it's one single measure which we are using to measure the strength of the relationship or the depth of the relationship between the two continuous variables and the way it is computed correlation it takes variance of x variance of y and the covariance that is existing between x and y and one major assumption in the computation of the correlation is it assumes that both the variables are normally distributed only when both the variables are normally distributed the correlation whatever we are computing through the formula will have some kind of a meaning okay so in this case if i have to compute it the variance of small we have already seen this much the variance of moderate is this much covariance i can very well use even the var function here saying small comma moderate if i put a var function with this kind of a stuff it is not giving me anything okay so then uh, let me put cov cov is helpful in terms of finding out the covariance cove incompatible dimension okay the covariance that is existing between the groups so i require the groups to be of similar size right so let's do one thing if i have to find the covariance between the groups and the correlation between the groups i need to uh, look at i can't take this example small and medium uh, small and moderate here let me just uh, go back to the data to see what correlation i can take okay we'll try to find out the correlation between uh yeah close and previous close both are quantitative variables so if i say i'll take the var function between close comma prep close this is giving me covariance 295837 9 the same logic if i am using co function also i should get the same result so either i use the variance function with the comma separated or i can use the covariance as a function so either of them will give me the same result covariance i can find out the variance of close which is equal to this much i'll also find out the variance of previous close which is coming out to be this much so what i can very well uh, say is the correlation is nothing but the covariance divided by the square root of the product of the individual variances it's as good as the product of their standard deviations so i am taking the product of their individual variances and taking the square root of them which is what is giving me that the correlation is 0.99995 i could have directly used the cor function also setting it between close and prep close saying that the correlation is also 0.99995 so whatever is the mechanism formula wise i can use the formula as the covariance between x and y divided by the square root of variance of x into variance of y so that's what we are using for correlation the covariance divided by the geometric mean between the two uh, variances that is what is uh, giving me the correlation so i can very well uh, look at the returns of the correlation matrix of a data matrix or a single value of the correlation in this case it's a single value of the correlation between one vector and the other but if i put uh, let's say if i put cor of the entire data frame price then it will give me uh, okay i need to have numeric variables so i will take second third fourth fifth sixth 
and this ninth column. I'll say correlation of price wherein I will consider all the rows but columns wise I'll consider only 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 9. I can find out the correlations pairwise for each of each of these variables. I'll find out the correlation. So it gives me a kind of a matrix. So what it says correlation between close and previous close is 0 0.9999. Closing price and total traded quantity is minus 0 0.05. So the higher is the price, the total traded quantity is going slightly lesser. Closing price and the total traded value is 0.12. Right, the higher is the closing price, looks like the total traded value is higher. Closing price versus the total number of trades is much lesser and even the change is also much, much lesser. So this is a very high correlation, closing price and the previous closing price. But other aspects wise, if you see here, total traded quantity versus total traded value, slightly on the higher side. Total traded quantity and total number of trades is also on the higher side. But this one, total traded value and the total number of trades, I could see that the correlation is much, much higher, 0.91. So between some of the pairs, the relationship is much, much higher. So all these kinds of things I can very significantly evaluate by using the correlation function. And this matrix, if you see, it's a symmetric matrix. Here also you'd see 0 0.0 or 0 0.120 here also. So whatever is the upper triangle, upper diagonal part, the, uh, the diagonal above the, no, sorry, the, the triangle that is above the diagonal, the values are more or less similar to the triangle below the diagonal, which means uh, across the diagonal you see a lot of symmetricity in the correlation matrix. So the correlation between A and B is a comma B is always same as the correlation between B comma A. In some cases, we will have one problem that is associated with the collinearity, especially the, the correlation with one single explanatory variable. If it is very high, if, if you see that the correlation is much, much higher, then the correlation with the single explanatory variable will be highly misleading. So if I have to put some kind of relationship between these two, there could be a lot of a lot amount of misleading, especially if the correlation between the values is significantly higher. Now this is where we will try to look at the concept called partial correlation. So partial correlation is talking about Finding out the correlation between x and y when the third variable z is constant. So the way it computes is it finds out correlation between x and y. Similarly, finds out the correlation between x and z. Finds out the correlation between y and z. And then it divides it by square root of 1 minus correlation square of x and z into 1 minus correlation square of y and z. So there are ways of finding out partial correlation wherein I am trying to find out the correlation between two variables keeping the third variable as constant. Similarly, I can keep the third and the fourth variables as constant and I can try to find out the correlation between the first and second. So especially if you want to do an in-depth path analysis, it's better that you find the co partial correlations of the values rather than just the full valued correlation. So there are uh, various uh, packages that are helping us to do this job. Right? You have a SEM package which is doing a structural equation modeling wherein you will rely on the partial correlation coefficient. You can also work with corp corp package which is converting the correlations into partial correlations. So probably let's uh, do this part. Let's install the corp car package. Let me install the corp car package. It's basically nothing but correlation to partial correlation. 
CVR is core correlation. PCVR is uh, partial correlation. So when I'm saying corp car, it's nothing but correlation to partial correlation kind of a package. So this one, corp car, which is correlation to partial correlation kind of a package. Let me install that package. Okay, so let me load this package library corp car. Oh, sorry, corp car. So I am installing this particular package. Then I would really uh, want to find out. So let me just check how do I give the input to it. So we are looking at uh, a particular uh, function called correlation to partial correlation. So I will use it as core to p core. So I am converting correlation to partial correlation. Sorry, I have to give a question mark to understand how I should give the inputs to it. Correlation to partial correlation. You could see here computes the pairwise partial correlation coefficients from either a correlation or a covariance matrix. So I have to just give a, a covariance matrix or a correlation matrix and it will do the partial correlation computation. Right? So we already have computed the correlation matrix. So let me uh, first assign that. Right? correlation matrix I am calling it as this I am calling as a correlation matrix now this correlation matrix I am giving an input to car to p car car to p car I am using correlation matrix cop now this is how the partial correlation is being computed from the correlation matrix Right, you could see here there are some changes that are coming up. Right here, if you see 0.99, then it is minus 0 0.05, but here it became minus 0 0.02, whereas here it became 0 0.30. So, the partial correlations keeping the other things as constant, the correlation between each of these pairs is computed. This is what we call as the partial correlation. So I can get the partial correlation between each of the pairs wherein one of the pairs is, I mean only the relationship between uh, each of these pairs by keeping all the other values as constant is what we are trying to compute and in a lot of uh, uh, practical usages we would be uh, using this uh, uh, PCOR which is the partial correlation which we would be uh, discussing much more detail when we are talking about the regression right uh, so uh, we can use this package corp core wherein we are using the function co correlation to partial correlation conversion as well then if i have to really test out the significance of correlation then i can use this function core dot test if i really want to see if the correlation is really significant or not whatever the correlation that we are computing so, if I want to uh, test out whether it is significant or not, we can use the core.test. Core so, the null hypothesis here is the correlation is 0, which means there is no relationship between the pairs of observation between the variables. Alternate hypothesis is R not equal to 0, saying that there is a significant relationship between the variables. So, I can very well give core.test wherein I am giving close as well as prep close. So I am getting the T value. It's again a T test that is performed. Degrees of freedom is 1529. P value is uh, 2.2 into 10 to the power of minus 16, which is less than 0 
So I will reject the null hypothesis and go with the alternate hypothesis. Here the alternate hypothesis is true correlation is not equal to zero. So I could see that the correlation is not equal to zero here. It is much, much different from zero. And even a 95% confidence interval is saying that it is anywhere 99.994% to 99.995%. So that is the kind of uh, significance, uh, uh, that's the kind of an interval in which the correlation is bound to lie. And uh, because the zero is not present in this 95% confidence interval, even there I can reject the null hypothesis and I can very well go with my alternate hypothesis itself. So the correlation test is significant, finding out the significance of a correlation. So the basic default one is the Pearson's correlation, which we have computed now. But there are two other methods of correlation, the theory of them, which you can uh, look at elsewhere. But these two are non-parametric correlation coefficients called as a Spearman's rank correlation or a Kendall stuff. Whereas the Pearson is primarily a parametric correlation coefficient, the Spearman and Kendall stuff are non-parametric and the way you can compute them is using this K and S as methods. So in this correlation, if I'm saying method equal to S, then it is computing the Spearman rank correlation coefficient. Even in this case, you could see p-value is 2.2 into 10 to the power of minus 16. The correlation is 99.98 even through this mechanism. So, which is more or less similar to your Pearson. Even if I am looking at Kendall's tau by substituting it with K, even in this case, I am seeing 99.22 is the correlation and the p-value is less than uh, 10 to the power of 2.2 into 10 to the power of minus 16. So even in this case, I have to reject the null hypothesis and go with the alternate itself. These are three different ways in which you can find out the correlation. The second and the third are more and more appropriate if we are talking about uh, uh, the correlation, uh, the data being more and more non-normal, uh, in which case it's better to go with non-parametric method whereas uh, uh, when we are uh, expecting that the data is more and more normal I can very well rely on the parametric way of finding out the correlation itself and I have to be very extremely careful when I am looking at the correlation across different scales because there could be a possibility especially when I am taking a time related data it might very well be possible for some set of observations, the correlation could be very much positive and for some other set of observations, the correlation could be very much negative. So it might very much be possible here, the correlations could be different between the big companies. For big companies, the correlations might be different. For small companies, the correlations might be different and for the moderate companies, the correlations might be different. Now, so those kind of observations also I have to be uh, slightly uh, careful of when I am going ahead with the correlation, right? Probably now we have done the correlation between uh, the close and the previous close, right? We have found that the correlation is almost point, uh, almost much, much higher. But I can look at the correlation across the different kinds of scales wherein I can uh, use the co-plot, right? I can very well uh, rely on uh, co-plot where I could uh, see the correlation between the two. But let's say across uh, the big companies separately, the moderate companies separately and the small companies separately. Given, so I will uh, try to find out the correlation between close and the previous close but I will try to uh, how do I give this input so if you are looking at the correlation between plot and uh, close and previous close right and we are talking about uh, creating it uh, conditioned on the groups I want to uh, look at the correlation across the groups. 
which are differentiated based uh, on, I mean, across the different groups, I want to look at the correlation between the closing price and the previous closing price. In this case, I could see as uh, more or less here also it's fine, right across the groups also it is looking more or less uh, uh, growing up kind of a relationship itself. But in some cases what we could see is at a broader level the correlation could be something else. But if I am going uh, inside the correlations could be something else. Now this is one more area where we have to be slightly careful of. Right, uh, the, the macro level correlation between the variables versus the micro level correlation. So this is one more area that we really need to explore when we are doing a data analysis. Now, the next important topic that we are looking at in this session is the kolmogorov smirnov test, which is the, 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 the kind of a test that we are performing to really understand are the two sample distributions the same. So I have taken a sample 1, I have to taken a sample 2. Are these two samples coming from the same kind of a distribution, similar kind of a distribution or they differ from one another in one or more ways. So is the distribution of both these sets of data more or less the same? Or do you find some kind of significant difference in the kind of uh, distributions that they are coming from? Or the second way where I can use the kolmogorov smirnov test is, does a particular sample distribution, I am getting a sample, is it coming from a particular hypothesized distribution? Is it coming from a normal distribution? Is it coming from uh, a gamma distribution? I am trying to hypothesize a particular distribution. I am trying to check whether this data that I am getting is coming from a particular hypothesized distribution or not. Now, when we are trying to compare two different samples, it might very well be possible that their means are different or it might very well be possible that their means could be the same but their variances could be different or even skewness could be different Kurtosis could be different. So, when I say that both of them are having similar sample distribution, I am looking at more or less on all the aspects whether these two sets of data are similar or not. Now, this kolmogorov smirnov test is uh, helping me in doing that kind of a work. It works on the cumulative distribution functions. Instead of working at uh, uh, each individual moment layer, it does not work at a moment layer where we are talking of mean, variance, etc. It's more based on the overall cumulative distribution function. So when I say cumulative distribution function, the definition wise, the probability that a random selected value of x less than or equal to x. So f of x is saying probability of x less than or equal to x. So this is what is the target for a kolmogorov smirnov test. I can use ks.test wherein I am uh, testing the significance in the difference of two distributions. I am not looking at just the mean, just the variance. I am looking at the entire distribution of both the data sets. So even if uh, the, the length of the two vectors is different, not a problem. It will, it will very well work on both the data sets. So the length of the data sets need not be equal to apply my kolmogorov smirnov test. Right? So, and it can be very well used to compare the data to the probability function of a distribution. First, let's complete the first part. Then we'll use uh, comparing it with the uh, probability density uh, function of something else. So let me say here small and medium are both of them coming from the same distribution. So I can say ks dot test and I'll say small and moderate. Are they coming from the same distribution or not? Right? So again, the null hypothesis says that there is no difference between the two. Both of them are coming from the same distribution. In this case, the null hypothesis says they are coming from the same distribution, whereas the alternate hypothesis says no, they are coming from different distribution. 
So based on that, I want to see whether the small and moderate, both of them are coming from the same distribution or they are coming from different distribution altogether. Now what it is saying, you see, two sample Kolmogorov Smirnov test, data is between small and moderate. The p-value is 0 0.005, less than 0 0.05. So the less than 0 0.05 is clearly saying that I have to reject my null hypothesis and go with the alternate. And what I could make out is in the alternate, the return distribution is different between the two groups. So the moderate uh, the returns are much following a much different distribution. So the, dif the distribution is not similar between the, uh, the distribution is not similar between uh, the small data and small companies' uh, returns versus uh, the moderate companies' return. That is what I could see from my Kolmogorov-Smirnov test. Right? It is simply assessing whether the difference between the two distributions is more or less uniform or is it very significantly different that has to be understood uh, separately. And in some cases, I can also use this KS test to compare the data to a particular probability function. So, if I want to say whether this uh, KS dot test, uh, sorry, whether this small is coming from a particular distribution, let's say a normal distribution. So, of course, I could have used uh, uh, Shapiro test for that. But just trying to uh, use the Kolmogorov uh, Smirnov test in this case. So I'll take the small. And the second one I'm comparing it with is the probability distribution that is associated with the normal distribution. So that's where I'll give the P norm, which is the probability associated with uh, uh, the, the normal distribution. Right? And uh, the inputs that I am giving to it, to this uh, p norm, I have to give the mean of the small. So I am computing the mean of the small. That is one input that I am giving. And one more input that has to go for a normal distribution is the standard deviation. So I will say SD of small. So these are the inputs that I am giving. And I am doing a KS dot test. So in this case, the one sample, this is called as a one sample Kolmogorov test because I am giving the mean, the standard deviation of the sample and I am doing a KS dot test. So here it is saying the p-value is less than 0 0.05. So uh, the null hypothesis is the data is following a normal distribution whereas the alternate hypothesis is the data is not following a normal distribution. So here I could see that the values are, uh, the p-value is less than 0 0.05. So I will reject my null hypothesis, take my decision in favor of alternate, which means I could clearly see that the returns are not following a null, uh, normal distribution. They should be following some other form of a distribution. Now, I is the same way I can uh, use any kind of uh, distribution. I can check my data with uh, against any kind of a distribution and uh, very well uh, uh, find out uh, what should be the, uh, uh, whether this particular data is following a particular kind of a distribution or not. So, kolmogorov smirnov test is even helping me to compare a particular uh, data set that I have got with uh, uh, a hypothesized distribution. Or it can be uh, used to compare two different data sets saying whether they are coming from a similar distribution or not. These are the two different kinds of applications that I can uh, bring out using the kolmogorov smirnov test. KS dot test is something that you are using in R for executing and interpreting this particular uh, uh, values. Then one more uh, context that we are uh, getting into doing a power analysis. We can define the power of a test as the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is false, which is like probability of committing uh, a type 2 error. 
right when I say type 2 error is a beta error, 1 minus beta is what we are calling as the power of a test. So, beta is the basically the probability of accepting the null hypothesis when it is false. So, if I am rejecting the null hypothesis when it is false, that is what is the correctness. So, I am talking about that as the power of the test. So, my beta error should be as much lesser as possible. But even I am making it as much lesser as possible, we have already uh, uh, identified that the probability of committing a type 1 error, alpha error will typically go up. If I have to reduce both the errors, we have already uh, talked of earlier that the only option if I have to reduce both the errors is the sample size has to increase. Now, here when I am talking about the power, we have different kinds of uh, inputs which are, uh, which are uh, influencing the power. The size of alpha, how much alpha I want, how much beta I want. The size of the effect, how much of error I can really, uh, uh, I can really effort to detect as being significant. What should be the difference between, let's say, uh, when I am taking a two-tailed t-test, when I am comparing ya bar minus yb bar, what should be that kind of a difference between the two, wherein I want uh, to treat it as significant? Based on that, it can tell me what should be my sample size, the variance of the samples. What is that I want to, I want the variance of my samples and also the sample size. All these are interdependent kind of variables. So, if I am using the power dot t dot test, it is doing actually a power calculation for one sample and two sample t tests. Similarly, when I am saying power dot prop dot test, it is doing the power calculation for the two sample uh, test per proportion. And when I am using power dot ANOVA dot test, it is doing the power calculation with respect to uh, with respect to the ANOVA test. So probably when you are doing the power calculations, the inputs that are required n is number of observations per group. How many observations do I require per group? If I already have the number of observations per group, then I have to provide that. Otherwise, if I, it can even compute how many observations are required per group. Delta, the difference in the means we want to be able to detect. So, how much difference in the mean I want to detect in that particular case? So, if I say I want to detect a difference of two units, the standard deviation of the sample, I have to provide the standard deviation of the sample, right? Then the significance level, is it 5% significance or whatever? So, I have to give that significance level. And what is that you want as the power of the test, which is 1 minus beta value you have to specify. What is that you are looking as the power of the test? Then you have to give the type of the test. Right, where you are, which you are carrying out, whether it's a one sample t test or two sample t test, and the alternative, which is talking about whether it is a, a one tail test or two tail test. So you have to give all these inputs, and based on some of the some of the parameters, especially n, delta, at least one of them you have to pass them as null, which would be computed, either n. So, which means if I want the sample size, I will pass this as null. If I say delta, which is like what is the difference that uh, can be treated as significant. If I pass it as null, it will compute that. Power, if I am passing it as a power, then it will give me the power of the test. If I am passing SD as null, it will compute the standard deviation. And if I am passing significance uh, level, then it will compute the significance level. So, from the others, it computes all of them. So, basically, let me try one simple uh, scenario. Right, one simple scenario if you are talking of, let's say I want to do a power dot t dot test, wherein I want my delta value to be 3. So, if the difference between the two values is 3, I will treat it as significant. 
and I am looking at the standard deviation between the values. The standard deviation of the values is somewhere around 5 units. And let's say I want the power of the test to be around 80%, so 0.8. Then what it does is, it simply computes that I need a sample of at least 44.5 or 45 observations in each of the groups. So that uh, a delta of 3 having a standard deviation of 5, significance level is taken as 0 0.05 the power of the test having 0.8 but let's say if I want to increase the power of the test to 0.9 it says then you require at least 60 observations and now let's say if the standard deviation goes from 5 to 10 then it says no I have to I if the standard deviation of the observations is going much much higher then the sample size has to be 234 if the delta of 3 needs to be considered as significant. So I should very well determine my sample size based on this analysis of how much delta I am uh, looking at as a difference. What is the kind of standard deviation of the samples? What is the power that I am expecting out of the test? Or if I put power as null and give all the other inputs, it will compute the power of the test and it can say that currently the power of this particular test is this one. So we can very well use this power analysis to assess what is the worthiness of the test that we have uh, performed or is the sample size really adequate for our test which can very well be uh, performed through this power analysis. So these are the various things that I wanted to cover as a part of uh, the two samples working with two samples. Right, we had an initial understanding of what are the different kinds of tests that uh, need to be performed. So we had worked on uh, comparing the variances, comparing the means. We looked at uh, uh, the student t-test, Wilcoxon rank sum test. So all these uh, aspects we have uh, primarily focused on. I hope you got a good amount of understanding uh, on all these uh, various aspects. If you have any further queries regarding the same, you can very well get back to me by giving me a call on the number that I have provided below or you can send in an email at wamsizer at the rate of pacegurus.com. Thanks a lot for listening uh, to this uh, session. Thank you very much.